If you're here live with us or watching on YouTube or our Facebook channel, it's great to have you joining us. Let me ask you a really difficult question. If you went to the doctor and he said, you've only got a month to live, how would that change your life? What would it mean for you to live like you were dying? How would your life change? How would it impact your relationships? What would you do to get ready for eternity? What would you do that you'd never done before that you're waiting for the right time to do? What would you try to undo or ask forgiveness from of stuff that you've done? How would God want you to live for that next 30 days? It's not meant to be a morbid question and it's not meant to be inappropriate. It's just a means to think through what's important in life. I remember someone asked me that question many, many years ago, and he said, even before I'd answered, well, if you think you should do anything different, maybe you should do it right now rather than wait for that time. And it's a bit arbitrary because, you know, it's not meant to be a predictor. Hopefully all of us will live more than the 30 days we will have lots of time, but it's worthwhile asking the question. And I want to be sensitive because sometimes as we ask the question, maybe you've got that. Maybe you've heard of a family member or a, a relative that has got really bad news. So I want to be sensitive if you're going through something like that. But asking the question is not meant to be more, but it's meant to give us an opportunity to reevaluate what is important in life. And I believe it's an opportunity to make life more joyful, more purposeful, more meaningful, because we've stopped rushing through life and we're making an awareness of what is important in life. So this weekend we start this journey for 30 days, for the next month, for the four weeks throughout March, to ask ourselves the question, what would we do differently if indeed there is only 30 more days to live. And I've called the series 30 Days to Live, 30 Days to Life. And it's a bit of a play on words because it is 30 days or a month if we had that opportunity only to live that time. And hopefully it's an opportunity to have those 30 days to live a more abundant life, to live a more fulfilling life. But it's also as we approach Easter an opportunity to have 30 more days until we hit that Easter period where we look at what Jesus did that brings us life. So in 30 days, we start that Easter series. The idea, I guess, even though it's, it, it comes from a book, it, it's a biblical basis of a parable that Jesus told about a man who thought he had plenty of time, who thought he had lots of opportunity to do whatever he wanted, and he didn't, Jesus told this parable. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. And then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. And that man in the parable, Jesus said, he's a fool. He's a fool. And we don't want to be called fools with what we do. We, we want to be prepared for eternity. Now, as I said, it's an arbitrary question because hopefully all of us have more than 30 days and there's certain things that we want to put in place in our lives that are long-term strategies. But it's about living life without regret. It's about living life not just thinking that we have 
an endless amount of time left on this earth. And that was the problem with this man, that he wasn't living right and he wasn't going to die right. We've got to understand that the death rate is 100%. We're all terminal. We're all going to die. None of us is exempt and none of us will escape. I don't often quote one of the popes, but... One of them said, someone should tell us right at the start of our lives that we're dying. Then we might live life to the limit every minute of every day. Because 30 days to live is not if, it's, it's when. We'll all get that. We're all getting closer to it. The Bible says that the Lord has numbered our days and we don't get to know what that number is, but today is one less day that we've got to live than we had yesterday. And when it comes to the number, there's no negotiating, there's no bargaining, there's no borrowing from someone else's life. There's some things you just can't borrow. You can't borrow someone else's faith. You can't borrow someone else's relationship with God. It's got to be what yours is. That's what we're all judged on. And none of us will live one second beyond the time that God has appointed for us. The departure flight, as much as all the flights these days seem to be delayed, our departure flight of life will not be delayed. We get what we've got. And we're all going to live somewhere forever. So as I said, rather than it being a morbid thing, it just is a chance to evaluate what is important. What are we going to live for? How will we live differently if we just suddenly come to that realisation that life is short? What, what do we want to fit in that we didn't before? And all those decisions are not just about the legacy that we leave behind, the impact that we have for those around us, but also eternity. Paul says in the book of Romans, another reason for right living is that you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up for the coming of our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So don't live in darkness. Get rid of your evil deeds. Shed them like dirty clothes. Clothe yourself with the armour of right living as those who live in the light. There was a strong sense in the early church, as Jesus said, I will come back. I will come back soon. And then he did leave. And there was a strong sense, I believe, particularly in the earlier letters, that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime. There's a real sense of the immediacy of Jesus coming back. And you can see often in the letters, the apostles just try to get that sense of immediacy. It's easy, though, to be lulled into a false sense of security, the the boy who cried wolf sort of stuff, that we, well, Jesus hasn't come back and I'm still alive and we just live life like it doesn't matter. But sections like this just urge us to live with a sense of immediacy. That Jesus is coming back or we will die and we may not get much warning. So let's look at how we live life to the fullest. Jesus said the thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So what would life look like for you to have life like Jesus wanted? What would life look like for you to live that sort of life? Not just full of things and full of stuff and building bigger barns, but just simply a fullness of life, fulfilled, without being cluttered and confused, without being overloaded and overwhelmed. What would that life look like for you? And that's simply the questions that we want to ask over the next month as we continue our series, and we'll look at a different aspect every week. 
But I just hope, and I'm praying for everyone that, that's here and those that are watching online, that you would consider seriously enough about this that you might make some adjustments. You might make some improvements. You might reprioritise some things and let other things fall away so that you'll be living the life like Jesus wanted you to. So let me look at three things today and then we'll look at some more in the next couple of weeks. First one is this. Live with a sense of urgency. That verse that we read before in Romans, Paul said another reason for right living is that you know how late it is. There's an urgency in those words. If you knew time was running out, you'd start to get a bit more urgent. If you remember back in the day, you used to take exams. And you're doing all that. I know it brings back bad memories for some of you. But the teacher says, it's half an hour to go or it's five minutes to go. What happens? You start to write faster or you start to type faster. There's, the, the time's running out. Let's go. Let's, let's fit as much as I can in. I've got so much more to do. And I think Paul is trying to get that sense of urgency to the Roman Christians. Instead of the, the someday or one day, you know, it's a dangerous word when we, oh, I'll get to that one day or someday I'll get around to that. Someday I'll have more time for the kids. Someday I'll take that trip. Someday I'll get fair dinkum with my faith. Someday I'll, I'll, you know, one day I'll get around to it. We might not have that time. What is the someday, one day thing for you that you are going to get around to that you haven't got around to yet? What is the thing that you would fix up in your life? What is the thing that you would try to undo or get rid of? The problem of the someday is that robs us of the this day. Psalm 118, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And there's often that, that sense of urgency in the scriptures as the writers tell us to make the most of what is today. Don't wait till tomorrow to do it. Don't wait till you're able to sort things out. Make the most of what is Today. Another verse that says, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. I'll, I'll do that when I'm, when I'm there. I'll do that when I'm older. I'll do that when, you know, you never get around to it. Now, living with urgency doesn't mean that you rush faster and do more stuff and do, do the exam thing. Frantic doesn't mean the same as urgent. But to live with urgency is just an awareness that life is short. I better make this and do this while I can. And the trouble even with a question like that, if you only had 30 days to live, if you're that sick, you might not be able to do those things. So while we are well, while we have that opportunity, what would you do that is urgent? Number two, live with a sense of eternity. Live with a sense of eternity. Back in that verse in Romans, it's, Paul says, wake up for the coming of our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. As much as it's a mistake to take today for granted, it's also a mistake to take eternity for granted. That it seems so far away and so distant and, and so much into the future that we needn't bother about it now. We'll get around to that sometime. And while we need to embrace today, we need to understand that today is not all there is. And that it seems a long way away, but we will have to face it one day. And he pleads for us to wake up to say, the day of salvation is a lot closer now than when we first believed. 
And, and there's the, the, the three tenses of salvation. The Bible talks about us that in the past there was a point when we were saved. I can think back to my time as a 10-year-old in Toowoomba at Margaret Street Church of Christ where I was baptised into Christ by Dr Arnold Caldicott. And I can look back and you, a lot of you can think back to that time when you were saved. The Bible says that we are being saved. It's a present continuous tense. God is working on us to make us all more like Jesus. There is an ongoing work of God in us. But there is a time that we will be saved into the future. And we need to be ready for that. Paul is saying that the full and glorious completion of the salvation is closer today than it was yesterday. And to ask the 30 days question is, would you be ready for that? Would you be ready if you were given that time limit? Or, and for the Christian, it's not just 30 days to live, it's Jesus will come back one day. And he'll blow the whistle and it's full time, the siren will sound and that's it. Are you ready for that day? Or are you waiting for the time to be right to be ready? Paul says in 2 Corinthians, our dying bodies make us groan and sigh. You ever feel that? When you, oh, yes. So relatable, that one, isn't it? There's a bit of groaning when you get up. Been to the gym, had a couple of those hard sessions, or oh, feel it the next day. But it's not that we want to die and have no bodies at all. We want to slip into our new body. You get a new body. So that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by eternal life. So one of the things I'd love you to think through in this 30 days starting now is are you ready for eternity? Live with one eye on today and one eye into the future. And thirdly is this, live with a sense of priority. How would your priorities change if you only had 30 days? What would you spend your last days doing? And really the first two that we talked about really inform this challenge of how to live with that sense of priority. If there's an urgency about life, if there's an eternity that is to come, what priorities would we put in place to live like that? How do we live with this sort of, you know, bifocal vision? You get bifocals in your, in your glasses or even contacts these days. How do you live with that both near and far distance, both at the same time? And Paul says in Romans 13, these words, don't live in darkness, get rid of your evil deeds, shed them like dirty clothes, clothe yourself with the armour of right living as those who live in the light. And I like that word picture that he gives, you know, if you've been working in the garden, if you've been sweaty, you're out for a run or a ride, you're just really dirty and you want to shed those old clothes and that's the sense that he's getting with our evil deeds. We can get rid of them like that because there's a priority of right living because of all those other things that we've talked about. And it requires adjustment. It, it requires a decision to do that. A writer by the name of Diane Ackerman said, I don't want to get to the end of my life and find that I've just lived the length of it. I want to have lived the width of it as well. I want to do the things that's important because it's not just how long you live, not just the the length of life, that you've had a good innings without any breadth or purpose. And understanding that is, is really what will get that sort of life. Jesus often encountered resistance of this sort of thinking from the Pharisees who just honed in on, on the minutiae, who, who got the small stuff, who who missed the big picture. He said, 
how terrible it will be for the teachers of the religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you're careful to tithe even the tiniest part of your income, but you ignore the important things of the law, justice and mercy and faith. You should tithe, yes, but you should not leave undone the more important things. And that's what the Pharisees, they were fastidious on the little things, of tithing, even the littlest bit of income, the, you know, the pocket money that they got, the, the, the herb garden that they had. They would tithe everything like that. And that's good to do that. Jesus said you should tithe, but you're missing out on the big picture, the, the mercy to show to people, giving justice, giving a fair go to people. You've totally missed out on that. Jesus said later that it's love that's going to be the most important thing. The way we love other people, the way we are aware of their needs, getting to know them and treat them in a way that love requires. And yet some people are more interested in, in the law than love. We're more interested in following the rules than we are in developing the relationships with people to get to know them. When you live like you're dying, you get a sense of priority of what's important, of how love is important. As someone said, the main thing is to make the main thing the main thing and to keep the main thing the main thing because we often get into what is not the main thing and get bent out of shape or worried or critical of the little things rather than the main thing. So I hope you're able to take this journey with us over the next couple of weeks to look at those things that are important. 30 days to live, 30 days to life. I want to share a little bit of a story as I've sort of just canvassed the idea. We have... Um, our staff, as you know, um, Sarah and Magdalene, we work Mondays and Fridays when we're together. And I work the other days and we have lunch together and often talk about things that are coming up and make plans and everything like that. And I was considering this idea for the series in, in the lead up to Easter. And I thought I'd talk to them about it and share some of the things that I've already shared with you. You know, what would, what would you think? You know, what would you do differently if um, you had an opportunity only to know that you were going to live only for 30 days. And Nigel and Sarah are great people. You know, you've seen Sarah's passion up here. They're deep spiritual people. I said to Sarah, what would you do differently if you only had 30 days to live? And she said, I'd eat more dessert. <laughs> and Magdalene said, I agree. <laughs> and I was looking for something, you know, with a bit more substance, with a bit more, oh, you know, meaningfulness. I heard someone else agreed, someone would wear those purple stilettos and get them, you know, so everyone will be different. So Sarah, as she's done, she said, I've already thought of this idea. And I said, what? She said, well, you know, when we, in winter, we get, different people to make soup, and we do a pop-up thing after church, and we call it Super Sunday, get it, S-O-U-P-E-R, Sunday on the day. And she said, we can do this, we'll have more desserts, and we'll call it Super Sunday. So she did the graphics, she said, oh, we can do, you know, so it's great that she is taking her job seriously here at the church. Not just looking after the children, but coming up with these, these thoughts to do. So next week, Pop-Up Cafe will be Super Sundays. And again, through the week, she's, she's not even working at the office. She said, oh, I've researched all this stuff. I found the ice cream. She's ordered it already. She's gone ahead. Um, so please come next week and eat it, because I promised anything that's left over, she can take home. So, um, <laughs> so Ben, you, we're going to hide some... But you, okay? So, yeah, come next week. Um, as I said, I don't want, want to make it just 
morbid and, 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 and stuff like that, but just help us to really take seriously what life is about. That we'd live life without regrets, without wishing we'd done this differently or more or better. So we'll even have desserts next week. It's Super Sunday next week, so I hope you can come for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that we have. This is your day. Today is the only chance we might get. I hope no one passes away in this time, but, Lord, we've got to be realistic that Everyone's life will come to an end one day. So help us to take these questions seriously and not live life with regrets or thinking we should have or could have or would have done differently if we'd had the opportunity. Now is the time. And Lord, each of us would answer differently. Each of us would answer that question in different ways. But help us to live with a sense of urgency to live with a sense of eternity, to meet you one day and to prioritise the things that are important to you in our lives. So, Lord, we worship you for giving us time, for giving us the opportunity to hear, for giving us this day. And Lord, we worship you in it and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.